Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Michaels, and I'm the IEN Senior Fellow at eBay. <clears throat> I'd like to welcome all of you to eBay's seminar series on US foreign policy. The series is part of a joint initiative of eBay and the Barcelona Institute of North American Studies that aims to promote discussion of US foreign policy related topics by inviting both scholars and practitioners to share their research and provide their insights. This evening, it gives me enormous pleasure to welcome uh, Michaela Hanukkah Moore, uh, Associate Professor of History at the University of Iowa, who will be presenting on the topic, Are We Going to Fight Wars in All These Nations? Citizen Responses from the End of World War II Through Vietnam. And just to give a bit of background, um, so earlier in her career, Professor Moore worked as a senior research fellow at the German Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, she was a research fellow at the Brookings Institution in Washington, DC as well as held other uh, history faculty appointments at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, York University in Toronto, and Southern Illinois University. She's the author of the book, Know Your Enemy, The American Debate on Nazism, 1933 to 1945, which was published by Cambridge University Press in 2009, and won a prize from the Society of Historians of American Foreign Relations. This book explored the political and intellectual context in which American popular and official conceptions of Nazi Germany were developed. She's also published numerous other book chapters, journal articles, and reviews. I must confess that sort of when I, <clears throat> I think rather randomly came across Professor Moore's uh, current project looking at the role of citizen responses to uh, wars in Korea and Vietnam, as well as her earlier work, I was most intrigued and wanted to uh, sort of hear more about this topic because most scholars who work on foreign policy, or at least you know those I've come across, seem to focus on the views of leaders and other elites and effectively show little interest in the other 99.9% .9 of the population. And in terms of sort of contemporary relevance, and we talk about this in my class a lot, um, you know, it's sort of it's notable that with, with Trump and uh, certain sections of the Republican Party in particular, the isolationist arguments, or to the extent that they are sort of actually isolationist per se, uh, or at least espouse some relatively coherent body of isolationist thought, seem to have struck a bit of a chord in recent years, at least in terms of the policy discourse, though not necessarily in terms of the policy practice. <clears throat> I must say I've been curious, I think for some years now, about popular attitudes to war, especially the extent to which elites perceive a, a sort of a default anti-war attitude that has to be manipulated for want of a better term. And even leaving sort of wars aside, um, you know, in my own research is sort of about sort of the negotiations leading up to the North Atlantic Treaty in 1949, I was struck by the power of sort of this popular isolationist sentiment, not wanting to have these binding uh, defense commitments with other European countries, in a sense, harking back to this rhetoric from the period of sort of Washington and Jefferson about no entangling alliances. And even prior to the North Atlantic Treaty, you know, there was quite a lot of resistance to the, to the Truman Doctrine. Uh, likewise, a few years ago, I, I came across a statement by the Harvard political scientist, uh, Stephen Walt, who effectively made the argument, and I'm sort of paraphrasing here, that the US population is very much against having an activist foreign policy that involves large military commitments around the world. And that if it weren't for a few thousand foreign policy intellectuals uh, basically advocating for liberal internationalism, that the US role in the world would look very different. Thus, thus basically we have the system that we have in order to keep a few thousand intellectuals in business. Now, I'm sort of, I'm sort of oversimplifying, but I, I did find it an interesting argument at the root of which is this idea that the views held by the population at large are somehow very different from those uh, of a narrow elite. Now, I don't know sort of how true or not that is in, in sort of contemporary terms, much less historical terms. And that's precisely why I look forward to Professor Moore's presentation today. So Professor Moore, uh, welcome to eBay and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dr. Michaels. Um, and thank you for this kind introduction and really perfect framing. Uh, we didn't even discuss this in advance, but I really appreciate it. It's, uh, it's such an honor and pleasure to join you today. So I will talk for uh, a few minutes about my research findings, uh, which are part of a larger study on American foreign policy at the grassroots level. 
in three distinct periods immediately after World War II, in other words, the, er the early Cold War, and then during the Korean War, 1950 to 53, and then the war in Vietnam. And here we'll focus on the early years, I mean, middle years, I guess, in some ways, 1964 to 67, before the protest was uh, publicly visible uh, by 1968. And then I'll pivot for the remaining time to drawing out some thematic and methodological implications of this work. And then I look forward to hearing your comments and questions about where this all fits into the uh, current scholarly discussion. This 1945 cartoon by the nationally syndicated I1J Darling shows John Q. Public in the upper panel missing his foreign policy pants. His wife, Congress, she's the bearded lady on the right in the lower panel, reminds him that he had thrown out the ones that President Woodrow Wilson had made for him a generation earlier uh, in 1917. In a telling act of denial, the Republican conservative uh, Iowa cartoonist here puts the blame for isolationist failings on the wrong actor. It had not been the public, but Congress, the bearded lady that had rejected the League of Nations a generation earlier in uh, 1919 and then again in 1920. Now in 1945, where we'll start our exploration, 81% of respondents in national polls favored their country's active participation in the United Nations, which was uh, being founded in the summer of that year. These polls were conducted throughout 1945. And perhaps not surprisingly, in separate surveys, which the US military conducted, GIs were with 99% almost unanimous in backing a strong international organization to keep peace. That was the phrasing from the, from the survey, from the poll. And I would add their thinking was, so we don't have to, like we are ready to go home and hand this over to someone else. My key argument is that ordinary Americans vigorously participated in national debates over foreign policy and their country's role in the world though their voices have often been sidelined, manipulated, as Dr. Michaels just said, or misinterpreted by politicians and scholars alike. Letters to President Truman, as well as other elected and appointed officials from 1945 through 1950, and the Truman Presidential Library, for example, holds hundreds of thousands of them, show that citizens often drew different lessons from World War II than their political leadership. In contrast to the newly emerging Cold War national security doctrine, the public's preferences congealed around two poles. One, as you see here, was a multilateral cooperative internationalism centered on the newly founded United Nations, even a world government, which was called World Federation at the time, garnered a lot of enthusiasm across America in the first two post-war years. So that on the one hand, and you can see the echoes of some of the previous New Deal, World War II administration's rhetoric, especially Vice President Henry Wallace's Century of the Common Man, but also Republican presidential candidates um, candidate when, uh, Wendell Wilkie's immensely popular One World book. And I would add that this preference for multilateralism, which for ordinary American always means burden sharing, um, was also based on actual war experience. There was right after World War II, um, a real palpable hope for a better world, which, President Roosevelt had promised, and people wanted to see that now. And the other poll where public opinion um, sort of comes around to is a focus on the domestic situation. And I somewhat provocatively call that an America first orientation, but I mean, there are two very different uh, facets to it. So I mean, not only the first one I'm going to lay out, but also a second one. So the first one is the conventional understanding of America first from Charles Lindbergh, let's say, to Donald Trump, an emphasis on economic well-being for this 
nations staying out of foreign wars and other entanglements. Um, even foreign aid evokes skepticism. So the nationalism in this position is palpable. But on the other hand, I use this term America first here also for another progressive and today we would say anti-racist position where people are asking how about we ensure democracy as in political rights, voting rights, civil rights, anti-lynching laws, which still had not been passed at that time. How about we ensure about, we, we um, make sure that democracy in that sense um, is secure at home rather than going abroad in search of monsters to destroy. I chose America first for this one as well, possibly controversially, you'll tell me about it because the phrase cleaning up our own home, taking care of our own affairs, appears in these letters that I'm going to present to you in a moment over and over again. And very often it's religiously articulated with reference to the scriptures, namely before we find fault with our neighbor, you know, let's take out the beam uh, of, our own, of our own eye. So at this critical moment in October, 1945, President Truman announced in a major foreign policy speech before Congress, the proposal for universal military training, which I have abbreviated on the slide as UMT, universal military training. The ensuing national debate lasted for three years until 1948 when the administration withdrew this particular bill because it just year after year did not pass. This first peacetime draft um, was rightly recognized as a major policy shift right in October 45 required by the new Cold War strategic posture that combined a confrontation with the Soviet Union or world communism, as it was often called at the time in public rhetoric, with US military globalism, establishing the US as the leader of the free world. Most Americans rejected this degree of military preparedness as un-American, undemocratic, and unchristian. So literally these three words come up over and over again uh, in the letters. In late 1945, Mrs. Burr of San Francisco wrote to Truman, if ever we are in a position to stand for our principles of free speech and press and free elections, it is now. Do we expect that Russia will listen to us sometime in the future because of our military strength? The peace cannot be built upon a mere demonstration of military might, she argues. And she concludes with everything is at stake. I find that last phrase interesting as well, because we know from the internal uh, secret classified deliberations of the Truman administration that they also felt everything was at stake. Um, but this sense of urgency was shared by the American public. Mr. and Mrs. Mathiel of Madison, Kansas offered four reasons against UMT. First, it is inconsistent with fundamentals of democracy. Second, it would foster a feeling of mistrust and rivalry among nations. Third, it would encourage a warlike atmosphere among people. Fourth, it will undermine the United Nations. So let me show you uh, a few of these letters that I'm referencing. And I'm going to quote from the brown letter that you see on the, the handwritten one on the right. F.M. Myers of Leroy, Minnesota, building on the conservative critique of the previous New Deal and World War II presidency asserted, quote, this country don't need compulsory military training in peacetime. Too much dictatorship here and now. Militarism is what brought Germany and Japan where they are. And this articulated in different ways and sometimes typed and uh, in sort of more lengthy uh, expansions comes up over and over again. Like, why are we turning into Nazi Germany? All of a sudden we just defeated them. Um, and um, this doesn't seem the right way to go. So I'll just show a few more of these letters. Frank Brandstetter beseeched the president, quote, the people are tired of war. It is not too late. Heed your people, work for peace. Let us strive to make our nation a happier one. Press for program of full employment, unemployment insurance, 
speedy reconversion of industry so that the people live in security and harmony. So the focus on the domestic situation. A common theme across the letters was the quote, great disappointment that the sacrifice and the victory of the recent war seemed to have been in vain, that the focus on domestic priorities had been lost. When a few years later, the Cold War turned unexpectedly hot in Asia in 1950, it only accentuated lingering popular preferences for peaceful cooperation or alternatively for a retreat from military globalism. At the beginning of the Korean War, letter writers asked, quote, why are our boys there? Why should our boys die? So the corrupt Syngman Rae regime should survive. Korea is not our problem and we have no business there, end of quote. In December 1950, Iowa farmers advised the Truman administration that communist China should be admitted to the United Nations. Quote, if we mean to shut out all representatives who don't agree with us, there is no reason to have a world organization, end of quote. Much of the dissent was expressed in a religious vernacular. The deeply devout and conservative Mrs. Irma Rockwell asked her senator, Burke Hickenlooper, whom you see here in the middle, Republican of Iowa. So she was writing to him as opposed to officials in the Truman administration. Quote, why on earth does any person think that war can destroy communism? Archie and Ellie Stark of Plymouth, New Hampshire, agreed with other anti-war voices a year later in 1951, quote, that the recognition of Red China would have saved a great deal of tragedy in Korea. The savage destruction of Korea today will not make better communists or better Democrats out of these hapless people, they continued. We can only beat the communists in the open market of political action based on an understanding and respect for all races and not by armed might, end of quote. From Etambwa, Iowa, D.L. Lampman warned, this is sort of a, a religious version of what this other couple who are actually in their 30s, uh, teachers at a prep school at a prep school in New England. So this one from Iowa has the same message, but differently couched. Lampman warns, quote, communism is an ideology and we cannot defeat it by killing communists any more than Rome could defeat Christianity by killing the early Christians, end of quote. Two years into that conflict, V.H. Andrews of Elyria, Ohio, informed Truman, nearly everyone I have spoken to feels that the conflict is a useless murder of the best of our sons and that it should be terminated, even though we may lose face, end of quote. This last phrase keeps recurring in the context of both wars, Korea and Vietnam. It indicates doubts regarding this credibility um, issue and obsession that Truman and Johnson, President Lyndon Johnson, shared in, in different ways. Uh, the reason why you also have Dean Acheson and uh, the Secretary of State at the time, and this young Marine, John Millett on the right here, is that some of these letters are addressed to, to other people than the, than the president, but everything is held at the, at the Truman Presidential Library. So John Moulet, the 20 year old Marine um, in early 1951 wrote uh, an open letter of sorts to the Secretary of State Atchison and asked, why am I here? You know, why am I fighting and most likely dying in Korea? And Atchison responded in an open letter, and that spawned a whole sort of subset of debates. And um, the the teacher couple that I that I that I mentioned actually wrote directly to uh, to Mulet. So this is what these letters look like, just to give you um, a visual. We have, um, as time goes on, a few more typed letters than uh, than handwritten letters. The, Korea, the war in Korea broke up in the uh, broke out in the wake of the Alger Hiss trial and coincided with McCarthyism uh, in the U.S. Thus, conservative anti-war voices used vocabulary and arguments available on the right to express frustration over the war and over not being heard 
And this frustration, I argue, spanned the entire political spectrum. So it was not, it was just, it was not just McCarthyites who protested at this point. Mrs. Harvey Sudo of Lyons, Nebraska, picked up on earlier interwar themes by asking, quote, who benefits from these wars? So it's the, the famous Stephen Wald, right? QE Bono. Ms. Fern Rogers of Dune, Iowa, asked, quote, if communism is dangerous in Korea, isn't it twice as dangerous right in our own land? And of course, so she is referencing McCarthy, Senator McCarthy holding up a list of 250 communists in the State Department. Shouldn't we you know, focus on that uh, first? Ordinary Americans wondered aloud why the most powerful nation on earth, which is what they have been told they are, uh, did not use its military advantage by which they meant the, the atomic bomb. Letter writers reacted to government's hyperbolic rhetoric of we are faced, we are faced, this nation is faced with a mortal existential threat of world communism, and now they are moving, you know, towards us in uh, in Asia by questioning the logic of limited war, which is what the so-called Korean police action was. So I mentioned this just to say, I think, you know, they had a point there and it was it was never really answered actually by the uh, by the administration. There was a mismatch between uh, the threat, the way it was explained and and the means that were uh, employed. 20 years after World War II and into the Cold War, some had internalized now the official messaging that America's national security had to be defended uh, not around the continental US, but in Europe and in Asia Pacific, so that the national security parameters of the US now lay you know, on these other two continents. For example, Jack Swender, a 22-year-old Marine fighting in Vietnam, so we're now turning to the Vietnam War, who wrote home to his family shortly before being killed in action, quote, the way I see the situation, I would rather fight to stop communism in South Vietnam than in Kincaid, Humboldt, Blue Mound, or Kansas City. These are all smaller towns um, where he's from in, uh, in Kansas. North Carolinians writing to their senator, whom you see here on the right, Sam Irvin of Watergate, famed Democrat, uh, conservative Democrat of North Carolina, were mostly looking for a way out, however. As early as 1964, letter writers to him, so mainly, uh, this is constituency mail, so mainly it comes from North Carolina. They asked, why have we taken it upon ourselves to be the savior of the world? The whole of Vietnam is not worth one American life. So this comes as early as 64. The deep sense of ambivalence that public opinion polls from the time uh, document is illustrated in these contemporaneous letters, which lay out lengthy justifications for escalation strategies in Vietnam or exit strategies. And I remember my surprise when I was reading this because the way these files in, uh, they, are, they are held in Chapel Hill in North Carolina, um, the way they are organized is pro and con, pro war and, uh, and against the war of another democratic president whom this democratic senator has to defend somehow, but clearly feels ambivalent about uh, as well. Um, the pro and con letters often merge on the point, we need to get out of there. And, and the pro letters say, let's escalate and finish it and get out. And the uh, against the war letters say, um, negotiations, let's withdraw, it's just not worth it. Nathan Drake of Charlotte did both, quote, as a veteran of World War II and the Korean police action, he wrote and advised, we should either blast the you know what out of them and get it over with or get the hell out of there, end of quote. By 1967, to fast forward, dissent became terser and citizens called Vietnam the stupid war. 
Ben Haas, descending from a family of veterans, so this is the South, you know, with a with a proud military uh, tradition and many um, military camps across North uh, the state, North Carolina. Ben Haas wrote, "Let's get out. This country, my country, has been at war, hot or cold, for most of my forty years. It is time to try a little peace again." End of quote. Mrs. Louis Locke from Mount Airy admonished. Quote, let us not be too proud to negotiate. So here are uh, a couple of letters and overall now type letters actually um, dominate. So while a clear majority of letter writers wanted out, they had different reasons. On one side of the spectrum, citizens favored diplomacy, negotiations, civilian investments, foreign aid, the UN or a UN Canada or uh, Indian brokered ceasefire and neutrality options. So I'm always surprised often uh, Americans write to their president or elected officials and they include uh, a newspaper clipping, usually from their local newspaper, which carries uh, a syndicated column or uh, a, a text, a report from a national newspaper. Um, and they are very well informed about sort of Fred Logovold's main point about the Vietnam War, that actually everyone was looking for a way out and there were offers being made uh, by allies and, uh, and from other countries uh, all the time. And Americans are quite aware of it uh, at the time. A second category who doubted Johnson's war was, if anything, even more agitated than these anti-war voices. Not wanting to appear weak, these correspondents resorted to resolute language of going all out and advising dropping the atomic bomb. But as I just said, still with the same goal in mind, let's get out of there then. Um, here too, a sense of quiet patri patriotism, of honor, of fear of things to come is noticeable. John Cheney of Hickory wrote as early as 1964, quote, to express my concern over the fact that every day we're losing boys in Vietnam. And I'm wondering if it would not be better to go all out. So let me briefly flag some of the recurring themes that you just heard and that are in these you know, thousands of letters. Um, I already mentioned different lessons drawn from the respectively previous war than the ones that the national security elites are uh, drawing and formulating. And what I found perhaps most stunning is that citizens articulated insights for which uh, IR realists uh, were, subsequent, were subsequently celebrated. So this includes in the letters, uh, a tragic conception understanding of human endeavors. In IR, I think we call that contingency, limits of power, unintended consequences. The need for humility comes up over and over again, something that we associate with a, with a theologian and realist, Reinhold Niebuhr. The recognition and acceptance of other people's nationalism and pride, Hans Morgenthau writes about that, but actually a little bit later than uh, my, uh, my letter writers, and warnings of overextension and militarization, which comes up as early as 47, articulated by Walter Lippmann and soon also by George F. Kennan. Um, and this is exactly what uh, American, ordinary Americans are warning off uh, as well. In contrast to ambitious politicians and defense intellectuals, some Americans clearly stated their belief that their country could not and really should not attempt to shape the course and outcome of human history. And that often was couched in religious language. Most importantly, Americans across the political spectrum and in each generation showed themselves invested in the American dream at home and prioritized its realization at home over any ambition to uh, export it. So I will finish up with um, articulating some themes with this, which this project addresses and which we can also take up in the, in the Q and A.
One key finding that goes against the grain of much of the literature on American public opinion and foreign relations is that these sources reveal a, a, a multidimensional opinion landscape, which defines the binaries that we use when we talk about uh, US foreign policy, namely conservative versus liberal, hawks versus doves, unilateralism versus multilateralism, and the last two, I almost want to put into quotation marks, isolationism and internationalism, because as you probably know, they are not what they seem. And we can talk about that uh, in a minute. I use a couple of analytical concepts to analyze and uh, interpret this data, um, including, let me just go, show you the whole list and then I'll just say a word uh, about each of them starting at the top, including public sphere, political culture, study of emotions, nationalism and religion. I want to start with public opinion and, and polls because as Dr. Michaels and I spoke just in the few minutes before uh, the seminar, the, the theme of public opinion and foreign policy is one that is very much shared by historians and uh, political scientists. And I think that I could not do my work without the help of political scientists. So let me just say a word about polls and surveys. They are very problematic. Uh, they are quite flawed. They are very limited in what they can tell us. And they are absolutely indispensable for our work, for my work that I presented to you, because I could never make a claim like a majority of Americans, you know, were against or in favor or felt ambivalent or whatever, unless I can cite a whole cluster of surveys um, to you to prove my point. This, this is something claims like that cannot be made on the basis of letters of qualitative data. So my sources, including those I just cited from, um, the public and constituency mail, which is not only in presidential libraries, but actually in, in, in archives and in state and local archives all across the country, capture primarily white citizens. So therefore, for my larger project, even though I'm not getting into that uh, today, I use other more specialized collections, personal papers, private letters, oral history interviews and memoirs to pay particular attention to African-American experiences and their trenchant critiques throughout this period of US empire, as well as reflections of American soldiers and veterans who are sort of carrying out some of this foreign policy and bear the brunt of it, as well as three groups of refugees turned US citizens from World War II, from Korea and uh, from Vietnam. Regarding analytical approaches, I'll uh, conclude by just saying a few things about uh, ideology. 35 years ago, Michael Hunt, who was my mentor, put ideology on the map for the analysis of US foreign relations. Before that, we all seem to think that ideology is something that other people have, like the Chinese or you know, the Russians, whatever. Uh, and he defined the concept capaciously so that it remains somewhat synonymous with worldview. Much new and exciting scholarship has been done over the past three to four decades. And if you are interested uh, in this topic, I highly recommend the, the book, no seminar without the book recommendation that I listed here by my colleagues, Chris Nichols and David Milney with the title Ideology in US Foreign Relations, New Histories which really is a very significant update and uh, opens all these new windows and vistas into what Michael Hunt established um, 35 years ago. It just came out this year and it already, uh, with Columbia University Press, and it already won a prize from the International Studies Association as the best book in history of international relations, which is really quite amazing. So nevertheless, Hunt's original take which defined three areas as constitutive of US foreign policy ideology has held up remarkably well and runs through these other categories, analytical uh, approaches that I'm listing here as well. So let me briefly flag these. First, Hunt argued there is a nationalism characterizing and shaping US foreign policy, a nationalism that deemed territorial expansion 
and an overseas empire, later hegemony, as essential for domestic well-being and presented it also as uh, beneficial for others. So that's the famous mission civilisatrice. And as you can see from that, it's not so different from European colonialism and then power politics. Uh, in other words, American exceptionalism and uh, universalist claims are widely shared by other national ideologies and not quite as exceptionalist. The second pillar, Hunt argued, is a belief in white supremacy. He calls it in racial hierarchies, often rooted in white, Christian, and even more specifically Protestant self-conceptions as kind of owning, holding the true gospel that needs to be spread in order to uh, save and liberate people. And the third element is a sanctified notion of private property. So that will sound familiar, an unwavering faith in capitalism, which leads, Hunt argues and demonstrates in his book, he, is a, he was a historian, which leads by the 20th century to outright hostility against other people's revolution. So he shows the arc how at first, so the American revolution was really great, Americans decided. And already the French revolution had a lot of problem. And then came other revolutions and let's say the Mexican one and Americans get more and more critical. And by the 20th century, they just decide that other people's revolutions are uh, stupid and don't get to that you know, world important experiment that the Americans were doing. And the reason for that is um, that these revolutions were sometimes more radical and tried to, to bring about uh, a sort of transformative socioeconomic change. And so by the 20th century, there is a clear aversion uh, palpable against other people's uh, revolution and also against people at home who advocate um, socioeconomic change. So hence the purposeful confusion and deliberate sort of equation um, substitution of democracy with capitalism and of freedom with um, free market. So Dr. Michaels, I just saw you appear uh, again on my screen and I'm looking at my, I'm looking at my watch. Um, I have a lot more to say and there is a lot more to be said, but it does not all have to be said by me right now. <laughs> so I think we should pivot to Q and A and uh, give you and our audience a chance to uh, to let me know what your thoughts are and um, and to expand on any of, uh, of these topics. Oh, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for an excellent presentation. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, while we're <clears throat> waiting for some questions, perhaps I can um, ask one or two myself. Um, I mean, I sort of very much enjoyed this presentation. <clears throat> I gave a very different perspective on uh, on the subject that I'm sort of normally used to. Uh, I enjoyed especially the, the the just one anecdote that you threw in there about the Iowa farmer who wanted um, a sort of communist China to join uh, the United Nations or at, that, at that early period of time. <clears throat> if only U.S. policy had followed that uh, line of thought, might have um, uh, led to sort of very different results. Um, but one one sort of curious yeah, one thing I'm curious about with all these letters is, in a sense, the ideology behind the ideology. You know, the people actually writing these letters thinking thinking what that this will actually influence policy you know sort of why are they writing these letters and you know i don't know in terms of sort of your sort of knowledge of other countries but sort of is this normal for for you know in britain or germany or soviet union or whatever uh to be writing letters to policymakers just sort of people writing uh to them presumably thinking that this might actually influence policy. Uh, so if that's sort of like one question on the one hand, and also I'm sort of curious about their, their choice of who to write to, you know, seeing some who write to the president in the White House, others to their congressperson or senator. Do they think that sort of writing to one might be more effective than writing to, to someone else? And sort of a, a third part of that is uh, sort of what your, what your, um, uh, your, your sort of understanding is in terms of do you find that, say, a congressperson 
uh, and their staff or a senator and their staff will actually take more account of these letters uh, than, say, somebody in the White House. So perhaps we could just sort of start there and then uh, I think yeah. already one so, question in the, uh, in the chat afterwards. So. Yeah, so these questions go right to the heart of my project. And if I'm if I'm losing a thread, you'll remind me or, you know, someone else will remind me if there is there is interest. So let's start with why they are doing that. Um, the Americans, I, I was shocked and surprised. Americans are a letter writing people from the 40s to the to the 60s in particular. They write to, you have the sense that they are writing to some official. Uh, maybe they are also complaining about, you know, gas supply or something to their local guy. I don't, I don't know. Uh, every week. And they even talk about that in their letters. They say, you know, I'm so glad that I live in the United States of America where I can, you know, uh, address the president or my senator. Um, the letters to President Truman are particularly interesting. So there's quite a shift in tone actually over the decades. That's, you know, something interesting for historians. Um, quite a few letter, I'm a minority, but nevertheless, quite a few letter address President Truman as dear Harry. And then they explain why, you know. So there is such an enthusiasm and actually faith in democracy that, you know, over time I've tried different um, analytical concepts to get a handle on, you know, this chaos and cacophony of voices. Um, and I, at some point it occurred to me that Jürgen Habermas idea of the public sphere, right, this ideal that is never realized because no one is ever good enough and it's, you know, it's just, it's just an ideal that it actually is realized in these decades because these people uh, confidently feel that they have a voice. This actually changes over the course of the 20th century, you know. The country that I live in today is very different. But um, at the beginning, coming out of World War II, there so clearly is, and with all that New Deal rhetoric of the common man, and you guys are important, and you guys won World War II, there is such a faith that our voices are being heard, and it is important. And so my, my point of departure is, um, as scholars, and then I hope that one day, you know, some politicians, some some people inside Washington will will read the executive version, you know, of the book or something. Um, let's tune into these people. I don't think that they hoped that they were going to influence foreign policy. But one formulation that I often use is, as you know, uh, Dr. Michaels, the public opinion has been. Uh, a problem for American foreign policy throughout the 20th century, right? I mean, it has been a problem for scholars, it has been a problem for politicians, it needs to be manipulated, it needs to be, you know, sliced and diced and categorized. And my point is, American foreign policy has also been a problem for the American public. Can we pay attention to that? So I don't see a whole lot of um, hope or confidence that they have a major impact, but they think of themselves as being part of the debate. And both politicians and scholars are uh, ignoring them. And it really depends on, I, I think this, these are personal decisions to whom to write. The, um, the, the letters to, uh, to the two senators, for example, in Iowa and North Carolina are very respectful but uh, these are constituents, right? These people are going to vote and, and both of them head foreign relations or military affairs committee. So these people are going to vote. They are in important Congress, supposedly, you know, is making these big decisions or, you know, casting the vote on war and peace according to the constitution. So they are reaching for who is closest to them uh, and with whom they already have a relationship. Um, to, yeah, they are, I think they are hoping for influence. Yeah. And maybe I'll stop here. I think there were other aspects, but uh, maybe there are other questions. Could you read the chat for me? Because I can't see it right now. 
or the, or the uh, sir, 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 certainly um <clears throat> actually we have two questions um actually before before I, I sort of get to those just one quick anecdote um yeah. because i remember and this is just sort of watching uh some films but uh, I don't know if you've ever seen a film called Network, sort of this Padashevsky film from the 1970s, uh -huh. um, where, where there's a sort of scene where they're trying to stop some business deal uh, and they're trying to get the White House involved. And they say, well, send a telegram to the White House. And, you know, by, by midnight, we want them to be knee deep in telegrams and this sort of thing. Like, this is how you change behavior. And this is a film from the 1970s. But, uh, yeah. you know, again, and sort of just so different from today where we don't even think about this, you know, what do we do, send an email to the White House or something like this? It's just sort of a very different mentality. You know, actually, it is still happening. Does it? Okay. Uh, <laughs> you know that through Ben Rhodes, I think, wrote about that. So I've seen a couple of pieces in okay. the Atlantic. And let me just say that um, when, the, when the Obama administration left office, I was, I was so overcome. I had just... <laughs> become a U.S. citizen, you know, and, and President Obama was addressing me in this, you know, place in Des Moines where I got, um, that I wrote, that I wrote an email, to, and of course it was answered, so I just I had to <laughs> enact, you know, my research, so I think it's still, uh, and I have seen a couple of studies, though the one that comes to mind goes back to the Reagan era, where um, everyone elected, uh, so senators, congressmen, and so on, they were swamped, around, uh, I can't remember now, something, the Iran-Contra affair, they were swamped. So I think that still happens, you know, that sometimes there, there are actually shifts that, that, that result. No, no, and that's what I was sort of very, very, very pleased to know that. Yeah, it's very carefully analyzed. All this public mail in the Truman Library and other presidential libraries, it's categorized. So it's taken very seriously, although it's also misunderstood and misfiled. Yeah. <laughs> So we've got two questions. Uh, so the first one is, um, uh, it says, uh, it's eye-opening to notice how consistent anti-war sentiments were, more or less, from Korea to Vietnam. My two questions are, in your opinion, were most of the anti-war letters sent to LBJ, uh, did they stem from the social progressive thought of, let's focus on the Great Society project you promised us uh, instead, or more of a patriotic, if we can't win this war, then we should leave? Were there any letters written by African Americans who urged the president to focus instead on equality politics at home? And then there's another question from another um, uh, uh, participant, me, but I'll get to that later. Thank you. Um, so this is a really important question and framed exactly, you know, in the in the most pertinent way. And um, and my research is too limited at this point to answer it. Uh, completely. So I have found there are letters, people don't um, always identify who they are, though, though you would be surprised. Most of them do in some ways to establish their credentials or just to explain where they come from. Um, so I found a few African American letters, but not too many, which is why I'm switching to other uh, collections. Um, to find that. So I have not seen a lot of letters to the president by, uh, by African Americans. And I have not yet been to the LBJ library. So, so my research right now is limited and what I presented was limited to this um, large collection uh, on Vietnam in, um, in North Carolina. And uh, it's interesting so this is pretty early, which is why it interested me. And the Great Society is not mentioned. People are really, in their letters, they are focused. They are focused on the war. And they think that the war in 1964 is not going well, right? And the big escalation is a year from now, 1965. Um, they think that it's not going well. And this is why they, this is why they uh, want out. And because... I was interested in North Carolina and Sam Irvin because you know he's he's very prominent because North Carolina has um, a lot of universities and a lot of military camps. So there is a very nice balance between politically progressive and um, and conservative 
which is still Democrat at the time, right? I mean, it's the Southern Democrats are a very conservative party and, and, and Irvin uh, represents that. So I would say that the anti-war in some ways voices that I have seen uh, are on both sides and they have different suggestions on how to get out basically. So we have one other question from um, uh, Adam Svensson who asks, uh, we understand from um, uh, Dan Ryder's scholarship that politicians and decision makers are interested in the shadow of the weight of history. Uh, in other words, in terms of their foreign policy legacy, how much do you think those elites listen to and hear and respond to those citizens' inputs for their legacy ends? Yeah, that's really, that's really interesting. So for many more years than I have been studying grassroots voices, I have been studying, uh, like most of us, um, policymakers and uh, foreign policy experts. And I think that by the time these people come around to, to worry about legacy, because, you know, they have... Um, they have a lot to worry about. Any of us who has worked in archives knows that, you know, the amount of paperwork, right, that goes across there, uh, the president or the national security advisor or, you know, the secretary of state's um, desk every day, which we can leisurely study, is just, it's just tremendous. I mean, the, the input of information is just, uh, is just enormous. So by the time they get around to worry about their legacy, I think they use other they use other means. So I remember a lecture which I won't be able to put together in the right way now, but where I found um, quotes from the farewell speeches of every president from Truman through Reagan, um, where where this kicks in. And the advice always is don't go to war. <laughs> don't. The advice is a little bit what we had on the previous slide about um, let's exercise more humility, let's exercise more restraint. Of course, Eisenhower's farewell address is the most famous in that regard, but he is by no means the, the only one. So LBJ, I mean, people are drawing their lessons, their own lessons from their own action but it's too late. And in the next administration, we're going right back, which makes these letters from ordinary people so interesting because they seem to have a better memory and clearer understanding. Look, we tried this before. Um, can we do, can we try something else this time, you know? So I'm sort of very curious about, you know, having, having looked at the period of 1933 to 1945, yeah. Uh, sort of how much overlap uh, or not is there from that sort of earlier period in terms of things like the quality of the writing uh, and the quality of the understanding of the issues uh, and this sort of thing. I mean, the, the one reason I ask this is because I'm sort of just generally curious, you know, when you think about all the uh, Americans who went over to Europe or who served in Asia during the Second World War, the extent to which you actually see sort of a more informed, or at least with the, the GI Bill after the war, sort of a more informed citizenry uh, about world events. Do you, I mean, do you sort of get that at all in reading all of these letters, or is there, there sort of just some sort of standard that never really varies? No, it, it really changes quite dramatically. Um, I, I only pointed out, you know, how the, the paper <laughs> changes and, yes. you know, handwriting too, Talk but it, 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 the tone changes. Um, yeah, it changes quite a bit. And, and actually there we could drill even deeper. My sense is that um, everyone is writing, very poor farmers, around the UMT bill, for example, which is 40, which starts at 45, right? So it's like almost World War II, but this points towards the Cold War. Very poor farmers write, clearly on like kitchen paper with pencil to say, you can't do that to us. Um, if you take my son for a year, we have nothing to live on. We, we need him for the, for the farm. Um, and, 
and that was very, very widespread. So that actually was a groundswell of protest, which is why it never, you know, the bill never went through Congress. Whereas what I'm seeing for Korea and Vietnam becomes in some ways more and more elevated, but I think that's because I have not yet looked at all the possible collections. So I think if we, I have a lot of stuff that I haven't processed from Wisconsin and Wisconsin is very interesting because it's McCarthy. And I think there people feel, well, let's not even bother about those idiots in the White House. We write to the guy who hears us and understands us and, uh, and so on. So things change and what I, noticed in particular is how so so two things are important i think about your questions one is that i think that world war ii actually was a watershed um in the 30s and 40s there was so much of that new deal rhetoric of valuing the common man it's palpable. It's just, it's shared by everyone, even the people who hate Roosevelt and there were millions uh, in America. Like we are important. We as citizens are important. And also through World War II into the post-war period, that understanding that we Americans are not a nation who goes abroad in search of monsters to destroy holds. So there are, there are many studies um, currently underway um, by my colleagues that show that the so-called isolationism, which is a misnomer because it covers up, you know, so many different uh, political, politically relevant views at the grassroots level or in the public sphere, holds from World War I, which now was regarded as a mistake, right, in the World War I post-war period, uh, widely regarded as a mistake, um, this really holds through the 1940s. So there is a grudging recognition, okay, maybe that war, World War II had to be fought, we were attacked, you know, blah, blah, blah. And maybe it was a good war. I mean, we can drill further into that. Um, but now we're coming home, right? So what I really want to highlight with my research is that that attitude of, wait a minute, we are not a militaristic nation, actually really holds through Vietnam. I think that's where the protest is coming from. You know, you told us that we are doing it for this reason, but we have some doubts about this reason. Why is our national interest all of a sudden in Southeast Asia? I mean, this gets raised over and over again. Soldiers, you know, as young as 19 years in their letters, um, these are all published. So, you know, they're easily accessible. Um, basically, because they are already in the jungle, they have the insights that Robert McNamara publishes 50 years later in his famous books and, you know, in, in the documentary, namely, okay, so this is a civil war, we can't even figure out, you know, why, why are we intervening in the civil war and uh, you know, there, there are social programs that are provided by the communists. And if this is what, you know, these people want, you know, why not? I mean, in any case, it's too complicated and we cannot adjudicate it. This is what 19 year olds are writing home at the time. Uh, so we have uh, time for this one last question, uh, if you don't mind. Um, uh, Katie asks, um, uh, I know it's not the specific focus period that you're looking at, but do you believe that technological advancements have had a large influence on how the public reaches politicians to address these concerns. Has this ability to contact them changed positively or negatively? Katie, this is an excellent question. And I think about this, I think about this all the time. Um, so the answer is in another book, Jürgen Habermas just published um, this year, which is uh, the change, the structural change in the public sphere sort of taking into account the social media and so on. And um, so the, the short answer is yes. I think that that we live, you know, the dynamics are very, are very different, um, but I would not throw out sort of the baby with the, with the bath water. I would say that when I started on this project, I was dismissed by my closest senior colleagues as, oh, so you're looking at the crank files. Um, and another one said, I said, 
he said, I'm only looking at those when I get bored doing, you know, serious research uh, in the presidential libraries. And another one said, why are you studying that, you know, idiotic stuff? It's like reading, it's like scrolling you know, through the commentaries on the New York Times. So I think we have to be careful uh, not to dismiss the whole thing, right? Twitter, Facebook, and so on, and, 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 and the feeds. Um, and I think that if someone were interested in doing this kind of research today, there would be advantages. I think it would be easier because of, you know, programs that search, you know, that we can code ourselves to sift through all of this material. In other words, my warning would be, let's not be so um, in thrall of the loudest and most extreme voices there, you know, people are articulating their views in, you know, in through whatever media they can. Um, and they are not as stupid as the media often portrays them, or as we fear, you know, they might, they might be. Uh, that's a very good place to, um, uh, to conclude. Uh, on that note, uh, I'm afraid it's uh, just past uh, 6 p.m. here. So I do need to bring this session to a close. Uh, Professor Moore, thank you so much for giving such a superb presentation, which I found extremely uh, interesting and thought provoking, and especially that bit at the end there where we talked about um, the crank file and the, the cranks file and, and, and all this. Um, uh, you know, there's a lot more to mine from that. Uh, and, and I mean, I sort of even hate calling it that, but sort of, uh, sort of get where I'm coming from. Um, you know, you know this, this, this idea that, you know, you can actually gain so much by looking at these uh these letters uh and it's not you know it's so important not to just dismiss them as being unimportant or irrelevant so i'm so glad that you're actually doing this research and i look forward very much to your <clears throat> forthcoming book uh on this on the, on this topic um so just before leaving uh, i just want to briefly announce that next the next seminar will be um, uh next week uh, uh one week from today <clears throat> professor david houghton uh, who um, uh, is now a, a fellow at the London School of Economics, will be offering a political psychology perspective of various U.S. leaders from uh, William McKinley in the Spanish-American War to the Obama administration, uh, focusing on the, uh, the bin Laden raid on the one hand, as well as U.S. debates about intervening uh, in Syria on the other. So I look forward to seeing you then, and I wish all of you a very pleasant remainder of the uh, evening and uh, for you, Professor Moore, the rest of the day. Uh, so thank you very much, and I'll thank see you, you so again much next for week. Thank you for having me. Thank no, you thank, so much. Thank, thank you so much as well, and to everyone else.